Hello and welcome. I'm Mihir Mankad, a Professor of Practice of Leadership Communication and also Deputy Director of the Morrow Media Center. Delighted to welcome you on the show with a truly special guest that we have here, Ambassador Dan Mulhall, Ambassador of Ireland to the United States. Ambassador, welcome to the Fletcher School. It's very good to be here. Famous place. Well, thank you. Thank you. Ambassador, 31st March 1978 is when you started your career in diplomacy. Correct. It's been exactly 40 years. In those 40 years, you've traversed the world. You've been in New Delhi, yeah. uh, the country that I'm from. Yes. Um, yeah. Also spent time in Scotland, in yeah. Germany, uh, all in Great Britain, where right before coming to the United States. Also time in Kuala Lumpur and Vienna. Brussels, too. Now, uh, 40 years of diplomacy, how has it evolved? Oh, um, dramatically, really. Um, when I started my uh, career in the Foreign Service, um, we still communicated um, by uh, telex. <laughs> um, we had um, more or less manual uh, coding systems, which meant that you couldn't really uh, send very long messages um, uh, that were confidential. Um, uh, communications has totally transformed mm. itself. Uh, and uh, when I first started, um, any, anything that you needed more than six copies of, you had to make a stencil. Now, most of your uh, viewers will probably never have heard of a stencil, but you had to uh, get it typed onto uh, sort of a plasticated, rubberized um, document and then put it onto a, to a, uh, to a uh, wheel and, 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 and you rolled out the copy. So, so I, I always say I've gone from the era of the stencil yeah. to the era of the tweet. Wow. And that's been the, the progression in the communications world that I've witnessed personally uh, over the last 40 years. Wonderful. So from diplomacy to public diplomacy, public diplomacy roughly reach out directly to people. Yeah. You talked about tweeting, but how have you deployed public diplomacy? Well, from the very early stage of my career, I realized that there was great potential in public diplomacy. I, I had at university been a debater I'd been a debater at school, so I knew about public speaking and I felt quite comfortable that I could convey a sense of Ireland through my public appearances. So even from my earliest days in New Delhi, I remember once being invited by an Indian academic who was hosting the All India English Teachers uh, Conference mm -hmm. that year in New Delhi, and he asked me if I would come and give a talk, and I said, of course I will, and uh, we decided I would give a talk about uh, James Joyce. Mm. I turned up anyway at this event, and the audience consisted of 1,500 people. It is still the largest indoor audience I've ever addressed, and I was a 23-year-old uh, diplomat fresh from university. Uh, I, had my, I had my master's degree in Irish history and literature, but uh, I had to get up there and stand up in front of a crowd of that kind. I realized that, that we had something special mm -hmm. that we could offer, which was um, a story of a unique country that had um, emerged from a long period of, of historical mm -hmm. difficulty and trauma with the great famine of the 19th century. We'd also produced some of the world's great writers and to be able to talk about those publicly was actually a way of doing my job more effectively than I could think of any other way of doing it. Great. Well, you know, let's talk about the country that you've been representing for, for quite a while here to uh, as I think we mentioned, I mentioned to you a little earlier, back when I was 11, I had a chance to move to Ireland for a little bit, saw a bit of the country, the culture, you know, the, the people, the warmth. But as you have been an ambassador of this country to two different countries, how, what are some of the impressions of your country? How have they changed? And what have you tried to, to share about the country and culture? Well, Ireland has, has changed dramatically uh, over the last 30 years, probably more than any other Western country. Because 30 years ago we were a very conservative uh, country, a little bit, um, you know, um, not connected so well. Since joining the European Union, actually 45 years ago uh, this year, uh, we have been transformed in terms of our, our outlook. Our national prosperity has increased dramatically. We were, at that time in the 70s, um, the the least developed of the Western European countries. Now mm -hmm. we're among the most yep. developed. Uh, at that time, we maybe had an obsessive relationship with our nearest neighbor, mm -hmm. and now we have a much more balanced set of relationships with our European neighbors. All of that's been very positive, and that's why uh, in Ireland, European Union membership is hugely uh, popular yeah. with the public. 
uh, and that's why we have committed ourselves come what may to remaining in the European Union because we realise that, that is where our interests can best be served. Yes, so you were in Great Britain right before coming here in London I was. during the Brexit deliberations yes, yes. and at, um, some thoughts on, on being there in the process and, and perhaps the road going ahead. Well, I, it was a source of great disappointment to me and to my country that uh, our nearest neighbour should, after 45 years of collaboration with Ireland within the European Union, a unique partnership had developed, a very positive one with all sorts of spin-offs for our bilateral relations that they should decide to take a different road. Of course it's their choice, I don't believe it's it's going to be um, profitable for them, I think they will, they will suffer um, um, some um, downsides, but that's their own decision and we can't, we can't argue with that. Uh, at the moment, of course, um, our priority is on minimising the negative impacts for Ireland. Okay. Uh, the UK is not the kind of important market it was for us 40 years ago when 60% of our exports went to the UK. Now it's more like 15%. But still, it's a very important market and, and uh, something like uh, 65 um, $70 billion a year in trade back and forth uh, between Ireland and the UK. So it is a very substantial trading partner for Ireland. Um, but the most... Um, troubling um, part of the equation really has to do with the border in Ireland which for the last 20 years has been an open border. Mm. People become accustomed to being able to walk back and forth or drive back and forth across the border at will and anything that would harm that border would be uh, to us unacceptable and very risky from the point of view of the, the politics of Northern Ireland. So we have pressed successfully and our partners have, have supported us four square on this that there cannot be a border on the island of Ireland um, and therefore the British uh, have agreed to this mm -hmm. uh, in a declaration that they made last December but now of course we have to turn that into legally binding commitments and mm -hmm. that's what's being done at the moment and um, everyone accepts there can't be a border in Ireland but uh, what's not yet clear is how that will work out mm. when if Britain decides to leave the customs union for example leaves the single market, how are we to um, um, achieve that desired outcome that's agreed by everyone that we must arrive at? How are we to do that in circumstances where Britain has left the European Union, left the single market and left the customs union? Yeah. But that is something that has to be worked out between Britain and the European Union and we will be part of the European Union delegation in that regard and they have been very, very supportive. The European Commission that negotiates on behalf of the Union has been very supportive of Irish concerns about Northern Ireland. Okay. Well, complex issue and uh, you know, we'll see how this, this rolls out. Let's get you uh, to the present time. You're here in the United States. You know, it's, it's an interesting time for yes. us here. There's a lot going on. Undoubtedly. Uh, but let's, let's focus on just uh, perhaps lastly your typical day here as a diplomat at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. We have aspiring diplomats here. How do you structure your time and what does a day or week look like? Well, I, I, I get up early. Um, I try to read the Irish newspapers online because they're already five hours or six hours old by then. Um, I try to, um, to tap into what's happening in the United States by uh, watching the, uh, the early morning uh, news broadcasts on mm -hmm. American television. I, I tweet a few times. Uh -huh. I tweet a, a daily poem okay. uh, or, a, or a daily piece of poetry just to put something nice and pleasant and positive out into a the... A poem a day? Uh, oh, well, I, I, not a full poem, but I tweet um, 280 characters or, okay. or maximum. Right. So I tweet usually four or five lines from a poem, from an Irish poet usually, and I try to choose something that I think would be of interest to to the uh, those who follow me and to other people on Twitter. And sometimes, I mean, one poem that I... Uh, one piece of poetry that I tweeted there recently, uh, last year, was seen by 110,000 people. So it was it had yep. very, very wide circulation um, um, through Twitter, which is well, it's why I like Twitter, because I think there, there are lots of ways you can use it positively mm -hmm. to do things that wouldn't have been possible years ago when I started in uh, diplomacy. And then I, I go into the office. Um, I usually have a meeting with, uh, with colleagues to discuss some of the day's business. Typically, I might go down to Congress, mm -hmm. call on a congressman or a senator, I might have an official lunch uh, where I might speak at some business group or, or some organization that's invited me to speak, a think tank maybe. In the afternoon, I might have some meetings at the embassy with Irish interests coming to see me about interests or issues that are of concern to them or wanting me to support them. And then in the evening, I might typically host uh, 
maybe uh, a reception for an Irish company or an Irish organization that may want to promote its product or its uh, or its uh, or its services in uh, the United States. So it's very varied. Uh, no two days are the same. Uh, you have to be above all else flexible. Yes, you do. And you have to be patient because it's not the kind of job where uh, you see results. You know, if you're doing, if you're in business, even you can usually calculate. Uh, the outcome yep. on the basis of the profit and loss account in diplomacy uh, you can't do that most things continue and you contribute to things on an ongoing basis you move them forward but you may you may have moved posting before the final sort of hour of a particular event uh, takes place so I mean you know for example if you're working on, on say one of my colleagues in the past working on the Northern Ireland peace process it took 20 years to and still has to be worked on. So um, diplomacy doesn't have a neat beginning, middle and end. It's more of a process and you have to be willing to to stick with it and to, to recognise it's going to be a hard slog and that uh, results uh, are, are difficult to measure sometimes, but also there can be a long time in coming. Uh, well, for that reason, we appreciate your patience, dedication, commitment to diplomacy and the lives that you touched. Ambassador, thank you very much for coming to the Fletcher School. Definitely I'll tell you welcome. personally, I'm born on St. Patrick's Day, even though I'm Indian, and each year Excellent. I feel we celebrate in Boston where there's so much appreciation Indeed. for your culture. Yeah. And here. all over the United States, we have a wonderful resource here, which is the 33 million Irish Americans who uh, yep. identify with Ireland and who are keen to celebrate their Irish heritage anytime they can, especially during St. Patrick's Day. I'm back wearing another colour tie at the moment, but uh, in March, my ties are green and green and green. Ambassador, thank you very much very for joining welcome. us today. Thank you very much.